This tutorial is sponsored by the 3D Coloring Book, a project specifically designed to help empower artists who are struggling with texturing in Substance Painter and to help show you that anyone can create beautiful pieces of art with just a little bit of practice and guidance. To instantly gain access to hundreds of pre-made professional level models and hours of high quality tutorials, click the link in the description and begin your journey today. Hey guys, my name is Savannah Shergi, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I made my stylized character Orthorian. I'll talk a little bit about my workflow specifically and how I approach the stylized character for PBR workflow. So before we get started talking about the actual model itself, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different types of workflows that I use to create models. And um, the first workflow is what I would call a game ready workflow where you're creating a character for a game and it's gonna be rigged and animated and all that good stuff. So this is the workflow that I typically use when I'm making a game ready character. You start in ZBrush in the sculpting and you make it all nice. And then you, once your high poly mesh is done, you retopologize so that it becomes a low poly mesh and then you can UV it. And then at that stage, you move over to texturing. Texturing can be done in multiple programs like Photoshop or a Substance Painter or whatever it is that you choose to use. I personally like Substance Painter, uh, sometimes with some Photoshop action thrown in there on the side. Then you go into rigging and posing if you are presenting your model. You rig it, you weight paint it, and you want to be testing it as you go, making sure that the UV stretching isn't too bad. And then for the final stage, you want to do your final renders. And that can be done in any program that you choose. Now the other workflow I want to talk about is the high poly workflow, or what I would call the high poly workflow. Um, this is what I use to create this model. Orthorium. And um, it's, uh, as you can see, very similar to the low poly or game ready workflow, except there's no retopo section. So initially you start off the same way, sculpting. And then instead of doing retopo, and UVs, you do UVs and decimation. And that's an order on purpose because that's the order in which you need to do it. You cannot do UVs, uh, you can, but you shouldn't do UVs after decimating because the topology in ZBrush doesn't allow you to. And I am potentially speaking from personal experience on that one. So you UV your model with its nice, clean, squeaky clean topology and then you smash that decimation button and then you can, there's an option for when you decimate using Decimation Master to keep your UVs of your high poly meshes of each subtool in ZBrush. Once you've done that, then you effectively have a low-ish poly model. So we skipped all that good stuff and now we could take our UV decimated mesh into your texturing program of choice. Those are the two workflows that I typically do when I'm working on stuff. Um, it really depends on what my goals are. A high poly workflow for the like the model I'm going to be talking about today is enough for something that like I just wanted to, to do a personal project. Just throw some throw some nice some nice images in my portfolio of a nice orc boy. So that's those are the two workflows that I typically use. Okay, let's jump right into it at the beginning of the process in ZBrush. This is where we're gonna create our model. And here I have pulled up my son, Orthorian. This is my lovely orc elf son that I've created. And I, I modeled him almost entirely in ZBrush. Uh, we're gonna talk about how I created this character in ZBrush, some little tips and tricks for sculpting that they don't want you to know. And we're gonna help you guys understand a little bit just about what the process was for creating this model. When I start making a model, I like to model the entire body just because it's good practice. Uh, it allows you to understand, even if it's gonna be clothes or armor or whatever, covering it, it allows you to fully understand how the clothing should fit on the character. So I like to make, even if I don't render it out, out all the way. So like, for example, 
I did not spend nearly as much time on his little scary feet down here or or legs or anything like that. And that is because I, it's, it's not going to be seen, but for me that was enough just so I could understand the muscle structure and the bone structure of the character enough that I could move on and add clothes on top of it. So you can choose to render it out all the way if you want, but I chose to get bored with that part of it and move on to the clothes. So that's what I did. I've cut off his legs because as a punishment and we don't need them. So now we've got the rest of the body and you don't want to slow ZBrush down more than it already is. So we've got the body. Next, let's talk about the hair a bit. So what I do to typically make stylized hair is I really enjoy that sculpted kind of clean clay looking hair. Um, it's also just way easier and you don't have to go through the trouble of doing hair cards or anything like that. I also just really like the stylized look. So that's what I went for with this. Uh, I started off with this big chunk right here and his ponytail is missing. I don't know what happened to it, but I started off with this big chunk right here. And what I did was I start with an extracted piece from the head. So we've got the head here. But what I usually do is I make a little, not with that brush, not, that's so wrong. And then you can go in and extract it and then start sculpting on that. For the hair pieces in the front, I like to do these little wispies. That's what I call them, little wispies. But for the curve snap, snap brush, snap, 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 crackle, pop brush. For the curb, for the curve snap strap, I like to turn off the snap. So it's just curve strap, not strap snap. Now that we're all clear on that, let's move on. I like to take this brush, turn off the snap, and then just use it as a way to kind of draw my own hair wispies. Another thing I like to do is to turn on in this curve modifiers menu, the size button. And that will give you that sweet little tapered edge. In order to do that, you have to go into curve fall off. You basically want this flip so you can turn it down like that. We have a nice little tapered, tapered hair. And you can play with this graph to get the results that you want as well. Lovely. Another thing I wanted to talk about when doing stylized work specifically, to really tighten up a lot of the edges and pay attention to anatomy. So you can see with this character, I have a lot of really hard edges on a lot of surfaces. And that's, that's part of what brings the stylized style to life. So I've got a lot of, the, a lot of pinched areas around the nose, around the lips, around the cheeks, and that carries over throughout the whole model to have a lot of these hard edges. And you can do that with the pinch brush and the trim dynamic brush very, very easily. Those are two brushes I use all the time. Once your stylized boy is nice and sticky, sticky, we can move on to the next part of this process. You can do fun things like create a nice little base for your character to stand in or do what I did and make him take an arrow to the knee or hand. I have now given him a weapon. I've posed him. After you pose is when you want to do the decimation process. What decimation does is zebrish decides where all the little triangles should go in order to make your model look the same but without wasting a bunch of information on areas that aren't necessary to have as many polygons. So you want to UV your character first in a UV master, and then you want to decimate after you've posed your character. So now that we have our model completely ready to go with all of its UVs, we can export it and move into the next stage, which is texturing. Once you're finished with ZBrush, your file structure probably devolved into something else. We're going to take our model and we're going to pop right in to Substance Painter. Now in Substance Painter, this is when things get a little, a little tricky. You can have multiple materials. I suggest doing everything on the same map if you can. Maybe just the whole character on one material and then the background on a separate one if you like. For this, I found it was easier to do them on separate maps just for the unwrapping process in ZBrush. So that's why I'm using separate materials that I've assigned. At any point during the process for texturing, if you've decided to use Substance Painter to use the low poly as your high poly and it's not quite working right, you can jump into a different baking program. I like Marmoset because I feel it gives you more control over working with a lot of the different meshes with their really nice baker. <laughs> 
All you need to do to use Marmoset's Baker is go to your meshes, put your high poly into a high group once you create it in a bake group, and the same mesh into the low poly. Now, normally you'd be using your high poly mesh in the high poly folder and your low poly mesh in the low poly folder, but we're gonna do effectively the same thing Substance Painter was doing by using the low poly mesh, which is our only mesh, as our high poly mesh. And you go into your baker and once you've chosen your output folder and configured all your maps, you can bake it at 350 degrees for 25 minutes. If your computer is anything like mine is, and baking takes a long time, you can use this as an opportunity to go scroll on Reddit or Facebook, and usually by the time you remember, damn, my bake, that's when it's done. For stylized materials, I lean very heavily on a lot of the maps that I've baked doing most of the work for me, as I think that it creates a really nice effect in a lot of ways, and it's just generally way easier than doing hand-painted textures yourself. For the sake of this video, I'm going to turn the texture size down so it runs a little bit faster. You can do this while you're working, as Substance Painter is lossless. You can switch back and forth to different texture sizes and you won't lose any information. I won't go over every material in this video, but I will talk a little bit about how I made a couple different ones and you can play around with the settings in order to achieve a similar effect. If I press C, we can go into the flat texture mode and you can see there's a lot of visual information on just the flat texture. Generally, this is how you get that hand-painted look while also having that nice PBR stylized look that is so popular right now. Generally, what I like to do for all of my materials, but for skin specifically, is I like to start with the base color and use a couple of mask editors to create some cavity effects on the model. Once I do that with skin, I like to add some red detail that I manually paint in, some yellow detail, and some purple detail on the model. Then I like to do some baked lighting effects. You can play around with this in addition to adding some of the materials that Substance Painter has by default, like some of the skin ones, I like to combine the pores that are on some of the default skin materials that come with Substance Painter, in addition to some of the ambient occlusion effects that come with those materials. I usually just delete all the plasma and all those other really fine skin details because I think that they're distracting on the surface of the skin. But sometimes if you want pores, specifically, it's a really nice default effect. You can also recreate it yourself using some procedurals and some height information layers. For this character, he's got this arrow going through his hand, so I decided to create this blood effect by using a couple of different layers with height information by itself and some blood materials. With just the texture on and no lighting, you can see that there's a lot of the hand-painted looking detail in the model, and that's what helps to achieve the stylized look. A lot of the time what I'll do to work on things like fabrics is I will just use one of the default materials that Substance Painter comes with. Like for example, I think that this is the burlap sack material and I've just taken the information, the height layer information that comes with it in the smart material and used it on my own variation of building up the colors manually. For various pieces of metal on this model, I did the exact same thing that I do with building up the colors and using a lot of baked lighting and curvature effects, except on the base color layer, I allow the metalness and roughness to be very high to look like metal. You can do more or less hand-painted effects if you choose. I like to use a lot of the maps, and I like them to do a lot of the work for me. But feel free to do as much or as little as you want. That is why it is so important to make sure you have all of these maps baked whether you do it in Substance Painter or elsewhere. These maps that you see here are very, very crucial to this workflow. I heavily lean on the curvature map and the position and the ambient occlusion to do a lot of the work for me when it comes to doing these textures. Using the mask editor is a big part of what makes the stylized look so stylized. So now that we're done our textures, we can move into our final stage, which is final renders. I choose to do them in Marmoset, but you can use whatever program you like. When you come into Marmoset specifically, your model's probably going to look a bit poopy. But that's okay, because there's a lot of really great tools you can use in order to make your model look the best it can be. And this is very important, because you spent so much time doing all this work, you really want to make sure your presentation is top of the line, because you deserve it. You can also set up a turntable in Marmoset, which is really nice if you want to do a turntable video, or what I use it for is typically I will set up a turntable and then use it to spin my model around with one camera setting so that I can take different angled photos. We're going to start to turn on the light set I've already set up in the scene, 
A lot of these lights that are parented to the turntable are ones that I wanted to highlight different parts of the model that I want to stay in the same place. For example, I have a light set up over here that I wanted to highlight the shield. I also have lights set up down by the bottom of the weapon and the top to create a nice glare. I also have a light set up by the character's face as that's the focal point of the piece. The remaining lights in my scene, I mostly just do through trial and error, through what looks good. I like to do a couple of different spotlights acting as fill lights with different colors to make it more interesting. I also make sure that there is at least one or two different sources of rim lighting in the piece, as well as the main light, which is the most important. This camera I just created because it has no post-processing or render effects on it. So we can see what this looks like compared to the post-processing effects that I've added on my other cameras that I used for my renders. This is my main camera that I used for the majority of the shots. I duplicated it a couple times in order to create different angles, like for a portrait camera, for example. As you can see, this camera versus the one we were just on, it looks entirely different due to depth of field and different effects that I've added. Some of these effects are from the camera itself, other effects are done in the render tab. But for the majority of it, I just played around with the different sliders here in the post effects. Another thing I like to do is I like to go into the curves and mess with the blue and red channels in order to get a more rich color profile. You can also do this in Photoshop after the fact, but I also like to do a layer of Photoshop post-processing as well. For my portrait camera, I like to use depth of field in order to create a true portrait look. I duplicated this one so that I could fly around the model and take different angled shots like of the weapon and the shield. When you're ready to take your screenshots from Marmoset, you can go into your image settings and then from here you can choose the size, the sampling, and all this different stuff from the image and video settings. I usually do a couple of test renders with image and open. One thing that's really useful when doing renders is if you go into your image settings, you can choose to make your image transparent from the background. I think that about does it for this breakdown of how I created Athorian. I hope you were able to take something away from this and learn a little bit. And thanks so much for watching.